Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Mary Lauder, and you are listening to the Since You Put It That Way podcast. It's the show that examines various health, wellness, and medical topics from unique perspectives. We will be having discussions and guests that will cause you to pause and consider, well, since you put it that way. Hi, Dr. Mary Lauder here. Welcome to another episode of Since You Put It That Way. And we're continuing with our cosmic uh, health and wellness um, with Carol Rittberger and myself. Um, This is the second in a series on grounding. Earthlings, if you're an earthling, you must earthing or you're in trouble. No, you're not in trouble, but actually you should get grounded by connecting to the earth. And so my guest today, Carol, as a co-host, holds a doctorate in theology and esoteric philosophy and hermetic sciences. And she's been a medical intuitive for about four decades. And she weaves these perspectives of psychoneuroimmunology, spirituality, and metaphysics, esoteric healing, using metaphors with the body. And she does that into her medical intuition work. Um, Armed with this knowledge, any person anybody can participate more effectively in their own healing and they can also help other people heal. And myself as an osteopathic physician, I specialize in integrative and holistic medicine and I've practiced for about 30 years now and my goal is to reach out and educate as many people as possible. That's why I left the clinic. I left the building. Um, I always thought outside the box and so I got outside of the brick and mortar as it were. And the message I have is that your body can heal and you can heal your body. And not only do you get to feel well, but you can actually be well. And so my goal is nothing less than positively disrupting healthcare system, positively disrupting our medical care system, one encounter at a time. And that includes this podcast. So welcome to our podcast. Um, A good resource is this book here. If you can read that backwards, well done. This is called The Healing Code of Nature, Discovering the New Science of Eco-Psychosomatics by Clemens Arve, A-R-V-A-Y, Clemens Arve, The Healing Code of Nature. Also, we've got resources on the um, podcast about the how to get a grounding mat or grounding sheets, things that you can use in your home. I think there's even things called earthing shoes. But uh, remember back in the days, the earth shoe I had those where the heel was down, um, gave me a little bit of a sore heel. Um, so, but these are different because the sole is not rubber. So removing that rubber interface allows you to connect with the earth. So enjoy the podcast. Thanks for connecting with us and may you connect to the earth in an equally strong way. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Since You Put It That Way and our subset of a podcast called Cosmic Health and Wellness with our guest host with me, Dr. Carol Rittberger, and I'm Dr. Mary Lauder. Um, our previous podcast, we talked about grounding. We told everyone they're grounded, they're in trouble. No, actually grounding, go out and get with the mother, the mother earth and get with, uh, connect with yourself. And we decided uh, and with our discussion and, and talked about how really grounding helps us connect with ourself, with the earth, And it allows us to have great healing because of the current that comes from the earth itself and from the atmosphere. So uh, if you haven't listened to that episode, uh, please go back and listen to that. It was, I think, very worthwhile. And um, I I guess I'll speak for you, Carol, that and myself, that we decided we were going to incorporate grounding when we work with our people, uh, our clients and our patients. And that's absolutely we're seeing this can really be and how uh, obvious it was, uh, but yet hidden kind of in plain sight. So welcome to you. How are you doing today? Very good. Very good. Little pun intended. Feeling very grounded. Oh, there you go. All right. right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, I I, uh, am not, uh, I didn't get grounded in the bad way today. I didn't get in any trouble. So probably (laughs) because I was grounded. So (laughs) So I too am kind of in that same it's, boat. It, it's a good day, Mary. <laughs> it is. We're doing all right that way. So that's wonderful. So, well, this episode, as we talk about grounding and uh, health or lack of grounding, is kind of going into the chronic disease model um, 
but our relationship to earth as a result of it. So it's kind of a um, more of a, it's going to go into some existential discussion, but also some practical discussions. And, and what I found as I was putting the, um, you know, my thoughts down for this podcast, I ended up with more questions than I had answers. Um, yeah. And at first I was a little unsettled by that because I thought, well, we're supposed to be sharing what we know. And I thought, well, I think this topic is so significant. I'm not sure um, having answers is really the right way. I think being curious about this is super important. And being curious is a way through this because there aren't, uh, I don't think a lot of absolutes in this just yet. And there's ways we're kind of just feeling our way through a, a little bit of the existential aspect of our soul and our uh, you know, medical conditions that we have and things that, um, you know, we're really trying to figure out as part of the human condition. Um, and I think that, you know, curiosity is one of the key ingredients to have rather than saying you have all the answers. Um, cause I think that that's a good posture of, um, appropriate humility, uh, when approaching topics like this. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's an option, and I think it's an option if we look at the things that are really kind of in the forefront of the, you know, health issues that we have: the diabetes, the heart issues, um, the uh, neurological issues that we're experiencing. I go through, uh, you know, the chronic inflammation, whatever it may be. I think that it would be worthwhile for each of us to go in and ask all those questions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, look at it and step away from what we're doing. And that's not saying what we're doing is wrong, but step away from it individually and just basically ask, what more can I do? Yeah. And then I think that the way that we, when we step out of that, then we go back, we recognize just by that, what can I do? Then we go in and we engage in a way that we facilitate our healing we don't go to others and say listen heal me it's like we're a team what can we do I can do this and this is one of the things with grounding is it's an option it's a very the little bit of research that's been done is very significant on what this can do for us to heal and right. how it can connect with us help us connect at a deeper level yes and there's not going to be a large corporation that comes in to do research on grounding because the industrial, unfortunately, the industrial medical industrial complex, you can't patent the electricity. Uh, yeah. You can um, pat put a patent on the design of some of these products that you might use in your home for grounding, but basically there isn't a profit margin there, so it's not going to be pursued. Um, but I think it has implications. Grounding has implications to positively affect our health and positively um, support our wellness and our well-being that I think is that important. Um, and so thinking about living in harmony with ourself, I think of, um, you know, chronic conditions. Carol, I know you're so keen on this about how our emotions drive, our thoughts drive, our illness and our wellness. And when we talk about wellness, it's not just feeling better, it's all the way into vitality. Um, and, and yet there's this existential part of us, uh, whether it's we don't wanna let go, whether we're overcome by the fears of things that we've encountered, certainly we've had a pandemic, which interestingly, according to the literature that I'm reading on an ex on existential crises for humans, does not even make the list of an existential crisis after everything we've been through recently with COVID-19. Because in order to have an existential crisis for humanity, we have to wipe out entire generations or multiple generations across a broad geographical location. And so, you know, as bad as COVID has been, it doesn't fit a definition. So then my question is, do we have to adjust the definition? Because if it affected an individual, was there a crisis? Was there an existential crisis? I submit the answer to that's yes. Um, because I know when I had COVID before COVID was a thing in late February of 2020, early March, 
and I got it from a patient who had um, been in Italy and the doctors didn't know what it was and I was sick enough to have to be hospitalized and I almost didn't make it. I wasn't on a ventilator, but I almost, um, you know, it was touch and go for some, a few hours. And I remember then deciding that, hey, I want to live. And I remember mm -hmm. that. Is that existential? Absolutely it is. Uh, and I say that with, you know, a significant emotion in my voice. So are the things we're facing in our um, culture as a result of the um, inability to access medical care because we can't afford it, um, the medical industrial complex, the politics around healthcare, the politics around the environment, climate crisis, are these existential enough? Yes, because people are having responses to that. Um, their, their life is changing and driven by fear, uncertainty, and literally being ungrounded. Um, and so I do think at a personal level, there is an ex existential crisis. Um, maybe not for all of humanity, but I think all of, but it, yet going from the individual or grassroots upward, I think there is existential crisis going on that we're seeing. I don't know. Well, and I think that it is all humanity because we are energy. Yeah. And we're going to be constantly bombarded with the vibration of fear or the vibration of um, hatred or anger or prejudice or bias. I mean, these are very real in the consciousness of the world. And, and again, it's, it's, we can't go in and say, oh, well, it's this country or it's this and that it's a prevailing consciousness. And that is affecting us. We are energy. We are getting bombarded with it, <clears throat> excuse me, all the time because we're energetically. Uh, and if we are being in fear or in uncertainty, then we're going to have a tendency for our field to be open to that particular vibration, that thought form, if we want to say it that way, that consciousness, and it's going to be affecting us. Mm -hmm. And we're going to experience it through our own history, through our own trauma, through our own lives, so we can relate to it. But I think when we start looking at that bigger picture is to recognize, how can I say this, is to recognize that the thought of the one, it's kind of like the old teachings, the thought of the one affects the all. And I think that what we do is part of our responsibility of this living in harmony isn't that we can't go out and change other people's thinking. But what we can do is we can be aware of ours. Mm -hmm. And we can be aware of how that's affecting us and what can we do to change, to be living in harmony with ourselves, in harmony with earth, in harmony with the universe, within harmony of this consciousness. What can, what simple one thing can I do to be able to be that change? And the thing is, is that when we each do one, even may seem like insignificant, meaning we don't have to think about it. It's not a major magnitude change and everything. It goes out in the field of consciousness and goes out in this electromagnetic field. And there are others that are out there that are like the hundredth monkey. They've made a change. They can relate to it. And it's just like this ripple effect that we talk about. It's a, it's what Sheldrake's work was all about. Rupert Sheldrake's work about, about this morphogenic field. Right. Right. And, then and at the base of that field, right. if we want to look at it as we can relate to it, it's our connection with earth. It's our connection with our home. So, and our responsibility is to be with that home. Right. So and to we, care for it. Right. So if we look at, and I'm not trying to interrupt here, I'm just tagging on it, that kind of the opposite component or competing intention would be you know, where we're living in a trauma posture or uh, the result of a traumatic event because that causes us to dissociate from ourself. 
it causes oh. us to be separate. It causes us a dissonance, a separation, d disharmony. You know, the dissonance is like, what is that? There's eight steps on the, you know, uh, scale, right, in music. And then the dissonance is when you're at the seventh step, almost to the eighth. So it's not quite, you know, in tune and it's off just enough to really sound horrible, you know, and it catches you. And that dissonance is, is um, you know, it could be in a cognitive sense, either real or perceived. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the brain doesn't know the difference between what's yep. real and what we perceive. And so it, our fear response goes to both something that's real, that's going to take us or something that we perceive is going to take us that might not ever Absolutely. happen. So we could be living in this state of a cognitive dissonance and then be separate from ourself, separate from the earth and have a lot of anxiety in an existential way that we just stay disconnected. We do. And, you know, it's interesting because the word disconnected means that we are I'm going to use another word that's close to it detached is it's like okay well I don't want to have anything to do with the what's going on yeah. but down inside in our mind part of us it's like but I'm still going to control the outcome so when we disconnect it's like we're going to go in and it's like okay well I'm going to disconnect from myself and I'm going to disconnect from all of this outer world and all of the trauma and all of the uh, uncertainty and everything. But inside our mind, it's, it's like our ego is going, uh, well, that's not going to work. So we're still trying to control. We can't maybe control out there, but we're trying to control and micromanage ourselves and our emotions so much that what we do is we actually have this we're not capable of energetically detaching from ourselves or disconnecting by any means. That is not even humanly possible. But what we can do is we can shut the door to our heart. We can shut the door to the emotions. We can live in the mental. We can covet the thinking. We can give the, like, show up to the ego and say, here, I'm yours. You just make me survive. Tell me what to do. And I think when we look and at the topic that we're looking at, I think that if we go into that disconnect or even into the disassociation, which is a deeper level of the disconnect, that's when our body doesn't know what to do. It's like, how do we do this? What do we do? How can I, you know, am I going to be able to eat? Am I going to be able to do this? Am I going to be? And it just creates this kind of what I call this freaking out in the mental part of us and the ego takes over. And when the ego takes over, we're not grounded. We're not coherent with ourselves. We're not in connection with our heart. We are energetically. We are just not psychologically in the psyche connected. Right. Because you're correct. We cannot disconnect. Um, mm -hmm. It's like asking a fish, what does the water, what's the water like around them? Yeah. You can't describe it, but they're not disconnected from it, but they could feel like they're a fish out of water. Right. Right. And so I think that that's something. So, you know, if we look at chronic illness in light of this, I think of, you know, the elements of the earth. And I think of the support of the earth for the things that we need. Of course, herbal medicine comes to mind. Yeah. And how so many of our medications, even in the oncology world that treats cancer, come from the elemental table right? Of, yep. Or the table of elements that we've got that are the primary minerals and things from the earth, um, like cisplatinum. And sometimes we use gold, we use gold treatments and have used gold treatments for uh, rheumatologic conditions and things like that and cobalt and whatever. But, you know, we use things from the earth for our benefit, but somehow there was like an imbalance that occurred because then well, you know, uh, fossil fuels, if we take that, you know, you know, we've got the fossils that make the fuel that we have extracted for our use, but then we end up with, you know, um, 
fossil fuel emissions that are overwhelming. We end up with, um, you know, toxins as a result that, you know, get into our body. Um, and, you know, part of the chronic illnesses that we have have to do with our inability to detoxify appropriately. Mm -hmm. And so I don't even know, I don't know how to wrap my head around this. I do clinically because there's tests and I find levels and I know how to detoxify people and I know how the body works. That's, but really even saying that in this conversation feels pretty reductionistic, you know, mm -hmm. and and I feel pretty much like, look what I can do, but I really can't. Do <laughs> and, and yet, you know, there's a lot of folks who have been very toxic when I work with them that have gotten their lives back because um, I've worked with them. But I, I, what I do know for sure is one approach that I learned was I didn't fight the toxins. Um, I asked the body how it could better work. And I asked how the body could heal. And I think somewhere in that question is I learned how to help people. And what I listened for was to find what probably what we talked about in our previous podcast and even now the harmony of how we humans can coexist, can be a part of, can learn from, be supported by the earth and the inherent capacity that our body has to heal um, versus, you know, fighting disease and fighting toxins. And, um, you know, if anything's going to survive in, in this world, it's going to be mold and mycotoxins. Yet those are some of the things, if they're in balance, that are going to be the things that can make humans quite sick. You know, and I think of black mold toxicity and things like that. So we vilify things. Um, you know, so 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 why why do things get vilified instead of just saying we get imbalanced and we're exposed? I mean, where does how is how do we unwrap all that stuff kind of uh, existentially and philosophically? Because it's it's there at that level. Well, I think that you found the answer. And when you said, so let's look at it philosophically. What if we were to philosophically look at chronic illness and what does that look like? What is the body trying to tell us? And then go back and remember that the body is the most exquisite, sophisticated healing mechanism that has ever been created. It, it has something that can get out of balance and it has two or three things that can put it back in balance. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we stop looking at it from that, I'm going to say that reductionist perspective and we start looking at the holism of it and that philosophical completeness and holism of what the body is. Um, then I think that we're going to start to find the answers on how we heal. And instead of saying, okay, well, and, and even as a medical intuitive in the way that the body speaks um, and through the energy of it is that it speaks in the soul speaks in metaphor and, you know, excuse me for the language, but, you know, it's like uh, hemorrhoid is a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. Well, so then we just go basically back and say, okay, philosophically, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And if we look at that, it's like, well, I have a lot of things in my life that is a pain in my backside. I have a lot of things and whether we want to look at it energetically, we want to look at it through uh, the physiology of the body and the moving it, or we want to look at it from the standpoint of the emotions or maybe the thought structure that affects the skeleton. We can do any of that. Mm -hmm. And the the beautiful part that I've found of the 40 some years I've been doing this work is, is that in detoxing, there isn't one size that fits all. No. It's how do you, where do you feel that you have the most power and the most commitment and the most desire and the most inspiration and the most resiliency, whatever words are courage, whatever words we have, what's that one part of the dynamics of a chronic illness that you beyond a shadow of a doubt can look at philosophically and work on. And the beauty of it is I found in my work is, is that if you have an emotion such as guilt 
and guilt shows up in the left, uh, in the right breast. It shows up in the belly. It shows up in the uterus in the female. It shows up in the um, uh, gallbladder and these different places. And you, it's like, well, my God, Carol, you just said, I'm going to have to work with my gallbladder and I'm going to have to work with this and everything that's overwhelming. But if it was just something like taking and what emotion is behind guilt and what memory is behind guilt and just work on and that one thing, everything heals, Mary. Mm -hmm. So if we tie that to, which is, this is not reductionistic, but simplistic, okay, which is completely different. Mm -hmm. Simplistic is taking the complexity and distilling it down to what really matters. So if we were to do that, and we, you know, in our last podcast talked about grounding and how mm -hmm. beneficial that is. So a person could actually do a grounded meditation around guilt. Absolutely. Or a prayer or a mantra or an affirmation. Yeah. All of those, there's, a, there's an interesting thing that in the research I'm doing for my book is that whatever we create from our heart mm -hmm. and our mind gives us the words and we use the, our own voice and the vibration of our own voice, which is connected to all that exists, including mother earth, we heal. And that can be a prayer, it can be an affirmation, but the power that we have to be able to talk to ourselves and to our body in a loving, helpful, supportive way with our own voice that is the same vibration in the heartbeat of our heartbeat and our voice of Mother Earth, we heal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, is that instantaneous yes energetically it is mm -hmm. does it take the human body a little bit longer yes it does it's designed to work in cycles mother earth works in cycles Seasons. so and so we just have to recognize that we have a 24-hour cycle we may have a 48-hour cycle if we've been really toxic we may have a 72-hour cycle but we're going to heal and I think that the, excuse me for kind of getting on the band box, but I think the actual shift of consciousness around dealing with illness. And when I say illness, I'm talking about more than disease, which is an actual physiological, pathological breakdown in the human body. I'm talking about illness. I'm talking about the body, the energy, the mind, and the emotions. Mm -hmm. And in illness, all four of those things are involved. And if right. we can philosophically step away and look at what's happening in the body and ask the question, body, what do you need? It's not going to say to us all the time, well, you need to stop eating Cheetos. What it's going to say to us is, so what do you love doing? Mm -hmm. Connect with your heart. Mm -hmm. Play creativity and imagination and grounding and mother earth and you know walk on the beach put the sand underneath your feet that's that is the philosophical approach of healing that was used so effectively throughout the history of prior to what we have as western medicine even eastern medicine uses philosophy in mm -hmm. its approach so yeah. Sorry for the rant, but I'm really passionate. Can you tell about that? I think yes, we have some no, that's great. tools. <laughs> that's, that, that's really great. Well, you know, and, and I I was, uh, yeah, I think the, the standard model of medicine is actually quite boring because it's symptoms and, and, and <clears throat> you know, um, pills and potions and, and symptoms and supplements. And, you know, it's really beyond... Um, uh, it's beyond just the physical body mm -hmm. it's beyond just what we look like you know what our what our body composition is it's about all of us it fully engaging in our life of what that is and what that's meant to to look like so if we go back to you know i'm going to digress a little bit back to this detoxification and toxins what do you you know what do we think because there's a We've got the kind of the younger generation coming in, and I've met a lot of them, 
that have ex, you know, existential angst about the environment, mm -hmm. about climate. And um, we've, there's so much politics around that. And that's not where I'm going. There is economics around that. I'm not, that's not where I'm going. I'm going to the cost of human life where we've got a buildup of toxins in people that is causing disease. Mm -hmm. And we've got imbalances there that um, people are dying from. You know, there's enough toxic buildup, um, for example, like with benzene that can trigger things for chronic myelogenous leukemia. You know, and then we've got overruns of viruses, Epstein-Barr linked to different types of uh, lymphoma and you know 90 probably 95 to 99 percent of the entire planet has had exposure to Epstein-Barr. Then we've had these other viruses come through like the COVID-19 virus and that seems to have reactivated a lot of these chronic viruses and I would look at these viruses more as toxins and I maybe that's not even the right word but that because they're imbalanced because we're out of balance. And so how does how do we look at that from our connection to the planet, our connection with grounding that we knew being connected to the earth was a good thing? How do we look at that and the concept of, you know, from a functional medicine standpoint, I deal with those folks who have mold intoxication or exposure with people who have heavy metal buildup and how that changes bone composition, cardiovascular mm -hmm. structures, pesticides, and organophosphates that affect the neurologic system, um, and, you know, things like that. Um, how do we look at that kind of philosophically through these eyes? Well, philosophically, a virus is a perfect organism. Okay, say more. <laughs> okay, so from the standpoint that it's a perfect organism, not from the standpoint that it can sustain, sustain itself, but it needs to have a host. Yes, it does. And so it's a non-living organism. So that means that it needs to have a disharmony in the human body in order for it to flourish and grow and multiply. A virus in the perfection of what it is, is constantly regenerating itself. It's constantly adapting to the environment. It knows exactly when showtime is because there's a perfect imbalance in the acidity and alkaline in the human body, or there's too much stress, or maybe there's whatever is going on chemically and it becomes active. So if we looked at a virus philosophically and we said to ourselves, and I know this is going to be a stretch, I understand that, we look at ourselves as a virus and that our sustainability is our adaptability. Mm -hmm. I think that's what these young people are. I think this generation is the generation of adaptability. Okay. I believe that they have come in and they have, we know from the standpoint of the research, we know that they have more active uh, codons in their DNA. They have a different makeup of the liver uh, as far as the filtration system that it's able to do. They have more active cells in the human body than we do. Um, their immune systems are able to fi uh, fight environmental contaminants. We have all this research, but we also know that they can die of a common cold. They can die of a common virus. So I think that if we go in and we look at the changes that have happened in just the evolution of the human body and the adaptability, not necessarily the mind, but the human body and that perfected part like the virus itself, then I think that our bodies are designed, these, the young, I, I say young people, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. That is different. That is actually my own, my age. Um, I think that the generation that's here now are here to be able to, they learn, they, to transmute the toxins and to be able to rid, to help the body rid the toxin the way it's designed. So okay, you have to excuse me. It's like age, I had a whole bunch of conversation going on in my mind at one time. So but what I, age group is that? What are you? What what age group are you thinking? What my brain is thinking is that it would be a value for us 
no matter what age, for our to look at ourselves, if we said philosophically, as part of something greater. Okay. And then, but the, the, the young people coming in, what age are those people that you're talking about? The young um, actually, probably in gestation, I'll do birth to 30, 35. Okay. They, they are, the research on them that's been done is they are anatomically different. They are evolved. They are like the adaptation of a virus. They have, they know how to survive in a world that is toxic. And their bodies are, have been refined to be able to do that. And I think through that, then they're going to be able to eliminate a lot of the diseases that my generation has had and the generation after me has had because their bodies are just different. They don't, they don't react that way. And I think what they're going to do is through that process, they're going to look at food differently. They're going to go back and look at uh, supplements differently. I think they're going to go back and if they go into functional medicine, I think they're going to look at the whole connection with earth differently. Mm -hmm. And I think what they're going to do and they, they look at growing their food and they look at the importance of the land and the importance of the organic part of it. And they look at the importance of water and they look at the importance of, um, you know, the things that we've done in other generations that have allowed us to survive, but they haven't necessarily allowed the earth to be able to thrive the way she's designed. It's like mother earth is always playing catch up. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're the generation in this age group that is literally going to heal a lot of the diseases we have, I think they're going to heal in their need for community and all the different things. I think it's not they're going to take us back to the simple times. They're just going to refine how we live. Mm -hmm. And I think medicine is going to have to work to keep up with them. Well, <clears throat> it seems as if medicine's going in one direction right now. Mm -hmm. It's going in the direction of profit margins. It's yep. going in the direction of consolidation of large systems and corporations and insurance companies where the majority of doctors in this country now work for an insurance company or hospital system. Correct. The vast majority, not just a majority. And so, but yet we don't want a one payer system, but yet we don't want to have health care for all, but yet we don't want to have people have access so they can not have, you know, be strapped with tens of thousands of dollars of, of bills which makes no sense at all. And we want to subsidize. Um, now I'm soapboxing it over here. Now they want to you know, subsidize things like for the uh, COVID vaccine so corporations can get the vaccine out right away in, in a safe and efficient fashion. But then when the companies make their profits, they don't give any of that money back. And that was taxpayer money. Right. Now, I just, you know, there's such an imbalance there. And then we see that then in the uh, other industrial complex areas where there's an imbalance towards profit margins. I'm all for people making money, but not when it, you know, is harmful, not when it's greedy, not when it's harsh, not when people are suffering. Um, and, you know, we've got that in medicine where people are... Um, are just overrun they're they're imbalanced and they're ill mm -hmm. and there aren't answers to healing them in the traditional sense right with mycotoxin illness black mold you can't simply give them a pill there isn't a pill to make that go nope. away no nope. um you have to work with the body's ability to heal find health and then allow the body to make its way to get rid of the imbalanced amount of mold and toxins from the mold that are present. That's what you do. With heavy metals, uh, well, we need iron because iron 
carries around um, and mixes with our heme molecules and our red blood right. cells to take oxygen. So right. we need that. But if that gets displaced by lead, um, then that, you, you know, your ability to carry around oxygen is diminished. Um, lead gets in the bones and it disrupts the calcium, um, magnesium, vitamin D balance, and we get osteoporosis and brittle bones. So we don't want lead around, um, but yet it's a part of what got us to where we were in the industrial revolution. You know, that was in the fossil fuels, the lead, um, you know, and the gasoline and things like that, petrochemicals. So, I mean, it's almost like, are we saying that this generation that's coming in the zero to 35 years old because they've adapted and that's probably the epigenetics, right? The right. result of the environment's pressure on our genes. Um, so when that occurs, that's almost like it's bringing the pendulum swinging back the other way. Correct. Absolutely. So how do we get out of the way of that if we're considered the, um, or how do we support it better yet? If we're considered the um, uh, older generation, which uh, I'm on the end of the baby boomers. I'm one of those at the very <laughs> end, um, but I'm still a boomer. <laughs> and and uh, um, you're a little bit ahead of me. <laughs> I'm I'm actually at the beginning of it though, so there you go. <laughs> yeah. So we're the the bookends of the boomers here. Um, <laughs> but how do we, you know, what do we do in our healing modalities and our approach to care for patients and our clients to really help them understand this? Hmm. Well, I think the first thing is is that we listen and acknowledge that it's real. Okay. I think that we move beyond the fixing <clears throat> and listen and then the person hears themselves and finds something that they can believe in and they can do. They they can personally feel like they're participating in it versus turning themselves over to just being fixed. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just listening, acknowledging, supporting their awareness, mm -hmm. offering things that are natural. Um, a lot of the medication, while it was originated from a true source of maybe a plant or a bark or someplace in the Amazon or whatever has reached a place where it's basically been modified to the point where the true vibrational essence is hardly there. And the body knows that. So, so I think that, that I think that we just feel from that product then. Absolutely. It won't because it, we're vibration. And if we're only getting a very vi minute part and our body needs a lot of it, then that pill's not going to work. It's going to, it's, and you know me, I'm not anti-medicine, anti-doctor at okay. all. I think the technology of medicine is absolutely phenomenal. I think the testing and the imaging and everything they have can give us a clear picture, can give us a diagnosis, the best that medicine knows. And then our job is to figure out what to do with it. Yeah. And I think if a doctor gives medication, no, we don't want to take it. But sometimes the human body just needs a little bit of breathing space and we take it. And then what do we look at? We look at things like you and I've done is we look at things based on the essence of who we are. And we say, what can I add to that? What can I do to replace that? How can I do something that's so pure to its origin or so pure to earth? And the body responds to that. Mm -hmm. I think that if we stop looking, um, so excuse me, this is a little dangerous because it's a generalization, but I think that if my generation, I'll speak for that, would stop looking at the younger generation as having their head up their backside, 
or not knowing what they're doing or not being conscientious or not worrying or not this and that or they're careful, whatever that thought is, I think we just need to let go of that th those thoughts because those thoughts are consciousness. They're, we're feeding on them. We're, we're so quick to judge anything different than who we are that we absolutely limit our ability to connect with ourselves, with earth and with our healing. Well, it's like we have a, we think that because it's not done our way, it's not safe. Absolutely. And one of the key things that we have to have in order for, to feel existentially okay is safety. That's number one. Yes. And the second thing is our basic human needs being met. That's survival, safety and survival. Right. And so we now look at that with um, ACE scores, adverse childhood experiences. But what we've done with those scores to some extent is we've said, well, we have an awareness of those scores and we put you in that category that you have all those things that you have to overcome. Good luck overcoming them. Mm -hmm. What if we were to change our thoughts and say, well, that's part of the human condition on this planet, everybody suffers. This is not the planet of the blue foamy drinks. That one's somewhere else. I've been there, but this is not it. <laughs> right. There's a lot more fun on that planet. But this planet, by and large, the majority, if not everybody, has been touched by suffering. It's a key, you know, key component of the human condition. So the research on um, self-compassion done by Kristen Neff and his yes. folks, you know, talk about the um, acknowledgement of the common humanity, the acknowledgement of the mind-body connection, and the acknowledgement that, you know, we're collectively in this together, um, making a difference. That tends to take the wind out of the sails of, well, this is happening to me only. Um, you know, and that existential, um, it, it takes us out of the center of the universe. And it helps us to identify with other people. Um, it connects us to other people. Yeah. It just It just energetically, instantaneously connects us with other people. It puts us back into the the consciousness that is the prevailing consciousness that everything is one. Yes. And, you know, I have found it difficult as a physician, as I've literally been putting, you know, my clinic together, which is virtual. I mean, I did, candidly, it was so much easier for me to do a brick and mortar. I could throw a shingle out anywhere. I don't mean shingles like shingles, you got them on your side. I mean, I put my shingle up with my name on it and, Boom, I could grow a practice. Now that, you know, I took the walls away, it's like it doesn't exist. And people mm -hmm. are like, well, can you provide care? I'm like, well, you went to a building or did you come to see me? Right? Did you, you know, did you come for me to connect with you as a doctor in the doctor patient relationship or did you come to a facility? And it's, it's such an interesting conundrum. And then when I work with people, then they get better, meaning they heal from something that's been critical. Then I talk to them about well-being and going on into vitality. And they're like, oh, no, I'm good enough. I'm just not bad. Mm -hmm. I'm like, really? How do we get, how do we, you know, turn that corner into the concept of we want to go towards well-being? We want to have vitality. We don't want to just get by. You know, um, well, I, I think a lot of it is the fact that well-being encompasses everything and good health encompasses the body. Uh, and I think our and I think our perception of healing is, is that if our body gets better, it's good. It 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 isn't that we want our well-being to support all aspects of who we are to support the body and that good health or they're even connected. But well-being is all of us. It's the entirety of who we are. Mm -hmm. And the thing with Mother Earth and this grounding as we've been talking about it, she supplies everything, literally everything we as humans need for vitality and well-being. Everything. Okay, say more. 
Well, um, again, we're depressed. We go outside, we get in the sun, we get the experience of the nature, we get the uh, air, even though it may be toxic or whatever, I'll go there with everybody. But we go and we do that. She's always providing for us air. She's also we all always providing the heat that we need, the night that we need, the food that we need, the water that we need, the emotional nurturing that we need, the psychological reprieve that we need. She's always giving to us. And everything is there for us to have well-being and to have good health. Where we fall from that is, is that we, and this is part of our responsibility, I believe, and our role to Mother Earth is, is that to find ways to grow our food without toxins, um, to find ways to use the insects that we absolutely can't stand because of mass production of food. So what do we do? We spray or we annihilate or we eradicate or we change or we do the GMO or whatever. And we basically take away the body's ability to adapt. Uh, yeah. So let me, what, what came in with that is that when I was talking about food is that I can go back with my husband grew up in a little town in California and um, they grew all their own vegetables. And they grew all their own vegetables and people would look at them and say, oh, we are growing all your own vegetables because you're poor. But the reality of it is, is they grew their own vegetables because it was easier than having to go to the store and do all the different things. They ate dirt. They would clean things and they ate dirt. They never worried about whether there was pesticide in the dirt or whether there was any of the contaminants or anything. And it's interesting because of the times that I went to my uh, husband's um, class reunions, mm -hmm. they had at their last reunion, 55 years after they graduated, they had more living student people than I had at my 50th. Okay. And we talked about that. We said, okay, so what was it? I, I asked them, I said, so what do you contribute to your longevity? And they said, we'd go out and pick our food and we'd cook it. And we would go out and put our feet in the ground and we'd walk around barefoot in the dirt. Mm -hmm. And we would go sit under a tree and have a group of friends come and talk. Or we would go to a lake and we would swim and enjoy all of the things. They didn't have the electromagnetics. They didn't have the cell phones. They didn't have everything. Everything that they had to exist was provided by Mother Earth. Okay. And they actually had, interesting because of who I am, they actually had less heart disease than kind of what the standard was. Their main thing that I found that was their problem, and I'm going to say it that way, is that they all identified that the main thing tied to their aging was the fact that they just didn't honor the needs of their body and they overworked it and they abused it. So therefore they hurt. Okay. Okay. But when I went in deeper research, they didn't have osteoporosis the way that we have. And I mean... These are people in their 70s that didn't have any of these things. So again, I think what it is, is that I think that it's important that we go back and we look at our responsibility to Mother Earth is to be her caretaker. We're Earth stewards. Mm -hmm. And she provides everything that we need in order for well-being. And she can provide everything we need for good health if we change the way that we eat, if we change the things that we eat, the things that the processed foods that loads up the liver, it changes the toxins in the body and the body's exquisitely designed to detox. But when we're feeding it and inundating it with all of the contaminants, it's got cycles, it's got design to it. It's not gonna instantaneously change any of that. But I do believe that the generation of these younger 
magnificently designed beings have had enough alterations in the epigenetics of who they are to be able to do this without having to think about it. They have community gardens. There's there's a dichotomy of that group though. You've there got, is. You've got the folks that are literally completely disconnected. Well, okay, we decided energetically that can't be, but their awareness of their connection isn't there because they're on their devices. They literally cannot write letters because all they do is they use their thumbs for texting and typing. That's it. Yep. And the they're not really connected. No. They're not really, they're not really connect. I mean, yes, technically they are, but they're not connected. You can't look as because I can see auras is that when I'm looking at you, because we're on Zoom, when I'm looking at you. I can see your face and we can have fun and I can see that, you know, beautiful sense of humor in your eyes and everything, but I couldn't tell you what your aura looks like because the technology distorts that. Ah, okay. Well, I put my best aura forward for you. I'm surprised you can't see it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't, I can feel it in your heart and I can see in your words, but it's just from the standpoint, I bring that up because when we think, you know, we're connected through technology and through cell phones. Yes, we are literally connected, but we're not energetically connected. Yeah, It's distorted. I believe that part of the differentiation that we are seeing in this generation that we're talking about is that we're seeing what consciousness has done, what in the boomers and their sense of entitlement, I think we pass that on. You know, it's it's generational work. Mm -hmm. But at the heart of who they are, they are very connected. At the heart of who they are, they are very connected with the bigger picture. Yes. So before the boomers, <clears throat> who are before the boomers? I don't know what we would call them. Three boomers. I don't know what would I don't know what we call them because yeah, I'm not sure we started labeling. <laughs> no, <laughs> but they looked at the boomers with suspicion, I would assume, mm -hmm. and the folks that were growing up in the '60s were looked upon with great suspicion for, you know, the counterculture maneuvers that they had. And now it's just handing, you know, down another generation doing the exact same thing. So something they're not comfortable about, something that's different. Um, you know, somewhere we have to, it's, it, it feels like to me um, that, and I'm closing my eyes to kind of get a better idea of this, is that the safety, the lack of safety comes in just because of the difference. It's just different. It is different. And so it's triggering in people that don't feel safe. And that comes from, you know, I, I feel, I believe, I don't have any proof, but from a, a lack of their own sense of a security, of knowing their place in the world, knowing their connection. Because on the other hand, the paradox of that is we're all wired for connection, love, and belonging. So if a person has connection, love, and belonging, and they they feel really good about it, and they live and they flourish, what does it matter that it, what it looks like? Right? Right. And I think of that the, where I go immediately as a physician and as is to towards, you know, um, gender towards uh, sexuality, towards, you know, what does that look like when people have some fluidity within their, um, both their gender and sexuality. And having cared for and worked with patients on that level, it was absolutely um, life altering for me. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's one of the hardest things to grapple with. And it's one of the hardest things our culture it judges people about all the time. 
and restricting care and restricting and thinking you can legislate things that really don't belong in any legislator session anywhere. Correct. Um, and it, it comes from and out of a sense of fear, which, you know, is from maybe not being able to control something. Um, and our lack of awareness to our own ability to connect how we need to connect, how I connect with Mother Earth, how I connect with Earth, how I connect with nature, even though you and I both go outdoors is different than how you connect. Yes. My relationship. But the, but the importance is, is that we do. Right. My connection with myself and how I have my feel good moments is different than how my husband connects with himself. Yep. And if but we he, philosophically accepted those differences instead of comparing and seeing them as opposite from us, the way that Mother Earth does, Mother Earth knows there's their duality, yeah. but she doesn't see everything as opposite. Right. If we can move beyond that, that use that philosophical approach to move beyond it, um, and you know, when I talk about something just came in, when many of the, you know, teachings talk about the oneness of everything being connected, and maybe it starts as simple as just recognizing individually and evaluating what does that look like to me? What does that look like to you? Mm -hmm. Um, then if we go in and it, if we looked at it that way, it would be compassion kindness, respect, uh, acknowledgement, it, it not necessarily accepting, but if you take those words and you apply those words to mother earth, she's all of those qualities. Mm -hmm. She's love. She's kindness. She's compassion. Um, she's respectful. Right. And even just look at the different environments there are the continents being different. The, the oceans, it's, it's, I mean, the oceans are all connected. Why is there, how, why are there so many different names of the ocean? Because the characteristics are different, but it's absolutely, all, it's all just water, right? I mean, I'm being a little, little cheeky there. It's all just water, whatever. No, there's different characteristics in each ocean. There's different ge geological features in oceans, different um, currents in each ocean, different animals and in 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 fish and and all that in in different ocean and even at different depths but well how can we accept the difference there but yet we can't accept the difference within us i don't know absolutely well and the thing is is that in oneness there's always duality mm -hmm. and so if you just recognize there's duality masculine feminine atlantic ocean pacific ocean indian ocean all the different oceans there's just duality in all of those different areas but they're not in opposition right they're not they're all one from the standpoint that there's a duality within the oneness but there isn't the opposition within it ego would want the opposition right? absolutely yeah and so if we could take that same premise of how you know with earth and with the, the grounding and we could look at that and we can look at that with people we love people we know people we don't know people who are in a different completely part of the world and stop seeing things as opposite then we don't we're not as inclined to be buried under that fear of safety or that concern about security or having to control the outcome, which we typically can't anyway. Absolutely, which we can't. Right. All we can do is control our thoughts and control our actions and words. Yes. On a good day. <laughs> yep. And there's times that, you know, we probably get a gold star after a name. And there's other probably times that it's like, yeah, you need to go be sit in a corner there and rethink this thing. But that's how we evolve. That's how we learn. But I think if we go back to our role with the planet, our being an earth steward, our job is to kind of like in Lion King, take what you need and always replace what you take. Yeah. So in medicine, then there aren't really and doesn't need to be a conflict. 
between what would be considered integrative, alternative, Western, Eastern. No. It's all healing. It's all healing. And we're working together in harmony with the body. And if we work in harmony with the body, we can then work in harmony with the earth. Absolutely. And Mother Earth will put us in harmony. Yeah. She will put us in harmony. A wisdom greater than herself. whether we sustain it there's therein lies the challenge in our humanness is that mother earth will always cohesively in her heartbeat and our heartbeat put us together <laughs> I, unfortunately i'm thinking about how mother earth corrects us when we when we get kind of cheeky and we challenge gravity <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah thanks thanks ma i got that again <laughs> <laughs> well she's oh so now we're gonna go there so all she's trying to do is just to call it ask us to rise above look beyond and see things differently let's be philosophical so let's shoot you off of the ground no gravity so anyway and and that's another part you know with um with earth if you stop and think about it is that there's a lot of humor in what she offers us yes stink bugs come to mind uh <laughs> yeah, just it's it's so if we if we stop and look at the grounding that again if touching it so from that esoteric that ex, um from every perspective is that you know it comes down to that's the answer yes and same i had a beautiful uh white butterfly garden this summer at the expense of my kohlrabi so <laughs> <laughs> but you got to see something very very unusual it, it was and i have never seen those types of butterflies before uh and it was gorgeous and they just hung around the garden it was just beautiful yeah oh i should take pictures and 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 i go over and i'm like there's no kohlrabi left all the leaves <laughs> were gone so the way that the way the philosophical thing is is oh I'm so glad that I supplied you all the food that you need so you could be safe and secure. Exactly. Those the, the mind goes in and goes, you ate that. You really you did really did that. <laughs> oh, and and yes, and there there just was no saving that. I've never seen and I've grown kohlrabi before. I've never seen him eaten like that my entire yeah. the whole the whole there's just a stubby stem was left. And uh, yeah. it's interesting because um, on the island, uh, our island, I'm sure that all of them do, we have wild pig mm -hmm. and there's no predators. Yeah. Um, unless a man can be a predator, but meaning that there's no natural predators. So in my garden, I planted some Chinese cabbage. Napa cabbage is another name for it. And oh my gosh, it was absolutely gorgeous. And I went out one day because I was looking out my window. It's like, what happened to all that? And the pig went in and ate all of the green, but left the white of the stem okay. to where it was a perfect star, this multiple star with all these different points on it. And I went out. And my first thing is, is I can't believe you ate all of my Napa cabbage. And then I went and looked at it and the way that the pig ate it, it didn't eat it down to destroy it. And now it's reliefing. Yes. Well, there you go. <laughs> and it's re and it's rejuvenating. And so I went in, I thought, well, if I'm going to, that, that pig, I'm going to pull that. And it's like, no, you know what? I, if I if feed you that, then you're going to leave this alone for me. So again, yes. but that's, that's the way mother earth looks at everything is that everything has a duality, but not everything is opposite. It's all well, part of the one. We would do well then to relax a bit. Yes. We would do well to let go of control. We would do well to let their know to let ourselves know that there's something greater than us, uh, always at work, and we would do well to know that it's better to cooperate than to um, oppose. And we would do well to know that the inherent wisdom that we have in ourselves, within our soul, our mind, our body, our spirit, can be in harmony with the inherent wisdom of the earth. It always is. The soul and the and the earth are always in harmony. Yes. What would be also something to add to your list is for us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this body is designed for healing. Yes. 
And if we allow it to do what it's designed and support it the way it's designed, it will heal. Yes. Yes. And our job is to, you know, this is one of the things with heart math, with the coherent, see that they talk about in the heart coherent uh, vibration, everything is that, you know, simply said, if we overthink, we're going to have irritation. Yeah. If we just allow and come from our heart, we're going to have a fluidity and a flow and the body heals. Yes. I think we can do all that and take our shoes off. Stay a while. <laughs> Actually, my shoes are off and it's not on earth. And I'm probably going to go do that. Yep. But again, I think that this whole concept of our role it's with earth is, is that she will always provide for us what we need. But our job is to replace what we take. Yes. And replace it in a way that is in harmony with her and yep. not in a way that's destructive to her. Yes. Well, there you go. I think we just said church. <laughs> I think we just finished it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for going way out in the cosmos there. I'm grounding and earthing and uh, all the things that make us human and delightful, uh, funny critter creatures we are. It's been the we are we are absolutely just delightful. We are precious. We are delightful. We are comical. Um, we are just so vast. Yes. And so we now can enjoy all that. Yeah. Um, well, and thanks to all of our listeners. We've we've gotten through the grounding. We hope that I hope that you have all taken um, advantage of your ability to ground. If not, uh, we strongly urge you to do so. And let us know how that has changed for you and what's changed for you. So until next time, thanks for being with us on Cosmic Health and Wellness, one of the uh, parts of, uh, since you put it that way, uh, podcasting. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Louder, and of course, my co-host here, Dr. Carol Ritberger. So have a great day and thanks for listening and viewing. Thank you for joining us on the Since You Put It That Way podcast. Today's episode was written and produced by Crowded Table Productions. Technical editing, Malin Long Lopes. Sound editing, Jonathan Fiegel. Music, The River Jordan, written and performed by May Erlewine. Please rate and review our podcast as well. We appreciate your feedback and hey, be positive, share the love. <laughs>